Hello, everybody. We're here today with Nathan and Matt from Market Chorus. Uh, fantastic and engaging company. We're super excited to work with them closely in the alpha phase, and we are thrilled to share some details about what they do and how they can help you. I'm going to let them both do their own introductions and talk about their company a little bit, and they have some fantastic resources here to share that's really in a learning environment, and we hope to get a lot out of it. All right. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Introduce yourself first. Sure. Hi, uh, Matt Summer, um, the CEO and co-founder of Market Chorus. And I'm Nate Binford. I'm the VP of Marketing, and uh, I'll be running the presentation today. So uh, we'll get started with kind of a brief overview of the purpose of this presentation. And I'll go ahead and share my screen while I talk through that. So Market Chorus helps publishers find revenue opportunities, specifically by looking at their audience data and their content in some new and innovative ways, and putting that together uh, through solutions that can be sold either as advertising products or used internally for driving subscriber growth. And so today we'll talk about the portion of, um, our, of technology that we use and also some of our technology that can be used to do those two, uh, to accomplish those two goals. So the topic of today is retargeting opportunities for publishers. Uh, so I'll start with kind of a, an overview of what even is retargeting. Um, retargeting is a type of digital advertisement that is delivered to people who have visited your website in the recent past. So that, that could be anybody who's come to your website, that could be somebody who's come to a particular page or section of your website, and then creating a targetable ad audience on another platform, like a Facebook or a Google or something, that can then be used as the, the driver for the ad campaign itself. Um, everybody has been retargeted before. Everyone has looked at a product on Amazon and they've been followed around by that product for days or weeks as they're going everywhere else on the web because that's Amazon trying to you know, close the sale. For publishers, there's a bit of a, a different type of opportunity, but the, the technology is still very much the same. The idea is if people have been to your website before, they're your readers, and if they've been many times and they're your loyal readers. And those readers are really the, uh, the asset that you have that you sell to advertisers and that you leverage for your own growth. And being able to know something about those people and what they're reading on your website gives you some very compelling opportunities to deliver them personalized advertising messages or promotional messages for your own brand. So where do retargeting campaigns even run, right? Um, it's not on your website. It is on the other websites that people visit after they've been to your website. So that would be ad networks like the Google Display Network or the Facebook slash Instagram audience network, um, as well as many others. LinkedIn allows retargeting, so does Twitter, but Google and Facebook slash Instagram represent something we call the duopoly. Those are the, the two largest advertising networks in the world. That's about 60% of the total advertising impressions that exist in the digital space are sold through those two different networks. So in very simple terms, you have a tight, loyal audience, but a limited number of impressions, and you can target those people on platforms where you have a theoretically limitless number of impressions, a much larger reach. So let's talk about one of those uh, examples of the networks. Um, Facebook's audience network, for example, is far greater than the uh, Facebook timeline that you would typically associate with like seeing a Facebook ad. And that's definitely part of it. People arrive on Facebook five, six times a day. They see four or five different ads at least each time. So there's a body of impressions just in terms of Facebook's timeline that you can access. But then above and beyond that, you also have mobile apps and news readers and you know websites attached to the Facebook audience network as well as obviously Instagram and Instagram Live. And the idea is a much larger universe of potential ad impressions than just what you might uh, be aware of on Facebook. And Google likewise has the same sort of a spread across all kinds of apps and websites and other platforms. So now that's what retargeting is and where it runs. Let's walk through a couple of steps of actually building a basic retargeting campaign. And we'll use Facebook for this example, but like I mentioned, this could be Google, it could be LinkedIn, it could be anywhere. Uh, step number one is creating a Facebook pixel and putting it on your site, which more than likely uh, most publishers already have this in place, but just to, just to cover everyone, just in case, if you don't already have a Facebook pixel, it's very simple to set up. Uh, Facebook's business manager is what you'll need access to. And, and it's important, I think, to distinguish the difference between getting access as uh, someone who's doing something in the advertising world on Facebook versus somebody who's running the Facebook page. So it's a completely different set of uh, permissions that you would have. And, and I know in most publishers, it's the, it's the editorial department or, or somebody who's managing social media. 
uh, who's actually running the Facebook page. And that control is usually pretty limited. So that's fine. Nobody has to touch the Facebook page. Nobody has to have any editorial access. In order to create advertising audiences and pixels, you just need to be given access as an advertiser, which doesn't give you access into any sensitive parts. So like if you were to work with Market Chorus, you would give us advertiser access and we would have no ability to see anything else that was going on in your system. And likewise, if you were to do that internally, you could have somebody in the ad team over here and somebody in the editorial team over there and they don't need to share access. So I think that's important to point out. But setting one up is very simple. In your business manager, uh, on the top left-hand corner, there's a little drop-down menu that shows all the menu options for business manager. On that is events manager. And when you click into that, you'll be given an option to create a new data source. And then once you do that, there's create a Facebook pixel, which pops up this screen that you see here on the bottom right, uh, which really all you have to do is just name it. Facebook will then generate a little piece of code that your operations or your IT team will need to put into the header of your website. Or if you're using a tag manager like Google Tag Manager, you would put the code in there and save it. And then you're done. And that's step one. So you have a Facebook pixel and it's on your website. Moving on to step two, it's time to build the actual retargeting audience. So like I mentioned previously, you can retarget anybody who's been to your website. You could, or websites, if you have multiple of them, if you have the Facebook pixel across multiple websites, you can do that. Um, you could target people who'd been to a particular page or a particular section, potentially even if there was a, a piece of sponsored content and you wanted to target all of the people who read that one piece of sponsored content, that would be something that you could do. Uh, in this example, we're just setting up kind of a site-wide retargeting audience for um, our example will be dallasnews.com. That's one of our partners. So we have uh, gotten to this screen. We're including everybody who matches the following criteria. So that's the default setting. You'll always want to have that. You would then select your pixel. So in this case, it's the DMN website pixel. And then because we're trying to target everybody who's been to the website in general, we'll have all website visitors. There's a few other options. You can target people who've been to a particular URL and so on. Um, and the final option here is the number of days that you want to track this audience for. So in the box there by default, it says 30. You could do 60 days or 90 days. You can do up to 180 days on the Facebook platform. And each of the ad platforms are a little bit different. So Google won't give you 180 days, but the similar sort of time frame that you could be tracking. So that's a rolling window. So if we're looking at the 180 days, that's everybody who's been in that time frame. And tomorrow it's everybody who's been in the last 180 days. And the next day it's the previous 180 days. And so the older people fall off if they haven't been to the website and new visitors are added onto the front. And so that's an evolving thing. So once you've done that, you've built your retargeting audience and you've given it a name, we can move on to step three. And in step three, all we're doing in this case is just building an ad campaign. So it, your ad ops team will be, I'm sure, familiar with how to build an ad campaign. And what this step will do is, is simplify the process for them. Typically, when you're targeting on Facebook, you would be typing in a bunch of keywords, trying to get at an audience that has interests in, uh, and if we go off of this example here, let's say philanthropy or um, you know, arts and culture, being a volunteer somewhere. Those types of interests exist on Facebook, but they're very broad. And Facebook is mostly self-reported data or data that they get because you've liked a page or you've said something. It's not necessarily really deep data and it leaves a lot of people who haven't said anything and haven't liked the pages relative to that subject as unknown to Facebook. Um, and, and in that opportunity or the opportunity that exists there is to use your own data because you know a lot about these readers, a lot more than Facebook does as it turns out. And rather than having to guess at a bunch of Facebook interests while you're building your campaign, it just simply becomes picking it off of a list. So in the prior step, you built an audience. And in this step, you're building a campaign and all you have to do is go to where it says use save audience and then pick that name off of the list. And then you're done with all of your advertising targeting. So that's it. First, create a pixel and put it on your website. Second, build the retargeting audience based on your domain or your URL or whatever it is you want to track. And then third, your ad ops teams will go about creating the campaigns and pull that audience off of a list when they're building it. Do you guys have any advice on just building audiences and, and what you would recommend? I, I know that a lot of folks may be, be thinking like, I'm not even sure where to start if I was gonna go build an audience. Yeah, so I mean, a site-wide retargeting audience is great, especially for internal purposes. So if you're trying to get people who are readers of your website to become subscribers of your website, one of the best ways to do that is to get them back reading more content. And so anybody who's previously been to your website is more likely than some random person on the internet to come back and read more articles. 
So just simply creating a site-wide retargeting audience and driving everyone back more often is going to have um, an effect on your subscriber growth goals in terms of the types of audiences that you might want to sell. Um, obviously, all of your readers are, are valid to your advertisers, but usually you want to segment that a little bit. So maybe it's your sports readers or maybe it's uh, you know, a particular thing that's happening in the news right now. And, and we'll get into how you can do some of those more advanced types of targeting here in a couple of slides. So there's, there's what you can do manually. And so that's copying a URL and putting it in one at a time and building a retargeting audience based on that. And then there's what you can do with the addition of like say market chorus based software that we'll get to in a couple of slides. And, and Julia, I'd add in also, um, one of the abilities of these platforms is also to do exclusions. So if publishers have hopefully long lists of subscribers already, you can add those via email or other identifiers and use that to exclude from your audience so you're not duplicating efforts and running subscription campaigns to people that are already subscribers. So there's lots of fine grain controls. It's just you know, how much work you wanna put into it essentially. That's awesome, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good one, Matt. Um, and likewise, um, the audience data that you're getting from your website is not necessarily geo-targeted and it doesn't necessarily have like age information with it. So there are some of those Facebook level targeting criteria that can be useful to filter that audience down if you have the need to. So if you're you know, running ads to people that are over 21 only, you would do that inside the Facebook platform, for example. Um, so we'll move on to talk about not just uh, what and where, but kind of why, what are the benefits of retargeting specifically for publishers? So typically in a normal Facebook campaign, you're gonna pay between 10 and $15 CPM or, or cost per thousand views to buy and deliver the ad. So if you were going to sell Facebook ads to someone, you didn't have to like add a 30 or 50% margin on top of that so that you guys had a margin to operate within. But when you're using your own data, you take all of the targeting fees that are associated with that Facebook campaign completely out and you replace them with your own data. And that's usually about 50%, roughly. It depends a little bit on the audience and who's bidding on what, but let's say generally speaking, you're talking about about a 50% savings on the cost per impressions. So that's beneficial to you in two ways. If you're running your own ads, driving potential subscriber acquisition, then it's half cost, great. And you also know more about them and you know that they're engaged readers, so it's more likely to be a reactive audience. Um, but as and from an ad sales standpoint, you are also able to buy them at half price and sell them you know, for the same price that anybody else can even buy Facebook ads and, and keep about 100% margin on it for yourself. So that's pretty powerful. And the second benefit would be that you can use this technology to reinforce your marketing messages and often sort of personalize them um, based on what people are reading to engage them more frequently, increase return visits and reader loyalty, which obviously adds up to a higher subscriber acquisition count. Um, your loyal audience is valuable, but not just on your website, right? I mean, advertisers come to you, they wanna advertise in your paper, they wanna advertise in your website because they value your audience. But that audience is, is really what they value more than any one particular piece of content or that their ad is next to any particular piece of content. And even recently we've seen you know, people are uh, keyword blocking anything that has to do with coronavirus or any other kind of important and relevant news that's happening right now, which, which is a problem. So the, the advertiser at, at an individual level, they may be interested in your news, but as a, as a buyer of media, they are interested in the audience. And so what you have as an asset that you can sell to them is your loyal audience. And like I mentioned, if they're on your website, you're already selling that. Most of you are already selling all of that inventory actually. But you can now reach a theoretically unlimited number of impressions on that same audience based on reaching them everywhere else they go online. And that's what retargeting is all about. So your engaged readers also are more likely to become subscribers, which means that when they're on your website, that's great. They're likely to potentially click on a CTA about becoming a subscriber. But what about when they're not on your website? What about when they're reading all the fake news on Facebook or they're, they're getting you know, messages from somewhere else? If you can be reinforcing your valuable, credible message at that point, then you're gonna be able to drive them back to your website and increase your subscribers. So why bother trying to influence your readers on other platforms? I mean, you have a lot of opportunity when they're on your website, right? Well, when someone visits your website, they generate ad impressions that you can sell. So there's a benefit in getting more people to come back to your website more frequently because that increases your ad revenue. Um, but then in addition to that, you also have this sort of audience extension idea where with retargeting, you can sell the same audience, the same loyal readers that people already value and already wanna pay you for. And sometimes you, know, you run out of the inventory to serve all those requests. 
but with retargeting, you can sell this audience while they're on Facebook or they're on Google or wherever else they might be. Um, let's talk for a minute about some specific examples of how segments of your audience might be interesting to different segments of advertisers or how you might leverage what you know about those readers to put personalized offers in front of them. So for example, and, and these are kind of one-to-one -one examples, and then I'll, I'll kick it to Matt for some more complex ones here in a second. Um, your arts and life readers are valuable to your city's arts and music community, your theater community and so forth. Um, imagine right now all these places are trying to reopen, uh, certainly they are in Texas, and you know the, the people that they're trying to get to come back and be patrons, they might take a little convincing. So some good healthy advertising to readers that are highly engaged in that content might be very useful to that community. Uh, likewise, uh, this is a big election year, but they kind of all are now. There's always something going on in the election space. So political readers are of big interest. And there's a lot of political ad dollars being thrown around. So if you could put that together into an audience that was intelligent, be able to actually say, based on what they read, we know they're this type or this type of interested, engaged reader and political um, uh, person of political interest, then you could deliver that as an audience for you know, the Republicans or for the Democrats or for lobbying organizations and so forth. Another one might be, you know, real estate readers are looking for places to invest their money. Uh, brokers, real estate funds, they're looking for people to spend their money. So you might be able to put the two of those together. Uh, Matt, this is a really good opportunity to talk about the difference in how Facebook might target people and the value that the publisher brings to the table and where there is and, and isn't an overlap in that. I know you have some good examples. Yeah, sure. Um... One of the original examples of this actually uh, when working with the Dallas Morning News early on uh, was to try to help get an understanding of how valuable their content could really be. So uh, one of the things we were tasked with was to try to figure out what the differentiation was between readers of a particular type of content, um, which is things related to the Dallas Cowboys, shockingly in the Dallas market, um, with what Facebook thought um, Dallas Cowboys readers or interests were all about. So um, one of the ways and one of the tools that Facebook actually supplies um, to help answer that question is called an audience overlap tool. So one of the things we did with our platform was initially identify all the content from the last 180 days um, within the Dallas Morning News owned and operated sites that were related to the Cowboys. And that doesn't necessarily mean it had that phrase, Dallas Cowboys, it's contextually related, right? It could be around um, particular players. It could be about charitable organizations that they run. It could be about bars to watch the game, right? Um, that's one of the things the platform does is extend into meaningful related content in order to create larger kind of meaningful sets. So by moving the readers of those articles into Facebook in the way that we're talking about through the uh, retargeting pixel, we were able to measure the overlap with what Facebook considers Cowboys interests, right? And that could be, again, it could be the Dallas Cowboys, it can be specific player interests that they name. Um, but the idea is to measure how much um, similarity there is between those two. And shockingly, as it turned out, and honestly, what kickstarted this process with them initially was that between several million people in the Cowboys pool based on Facebook criteria and several hundred thousand readers of various Cowboys content on the Dallas Morning News, the overlap was 14%. So if you think about that for a second, one of the immediate takeaways is even though Facebook's got a huge pool of people interested in the Dallas Cowboys, you certainly don't know how quality or high affinity they are, but they clearly do not know that people that are reading multiple Cowboys articles within the Dallas Morning News have that interest, right? There's a mismatch there. And that's a huge opportunity for publishers. And one of the things that we're always trying to stress, we like to say that your content is a lens, right? I mean, the act of someone reading article or articles on your website is a tremendous indicator of their interests, one that's real time and one that's not necessarily transportable or ownable by platforms like Facebook. So from that, you know, leverage your own IP, leverage your own reader data in a way that those platforms can't do and create audience segments that are totally differentiatable and even work more economically like Nate was saying earlier. Great. I love that example. And, you know, let's keep in mind that not only is this something that can be monetized, it can also be used to drive subscriber growth because you know what they're most interested in reading, you're able to deliver the messages. And I'm sure that you do this on your websites right now. If they're reading a particular piece of content, you're probably giving them a particular type of offer. Take that same idea and then move it off platform based on what you know that other people don't know about your readers. And, and that's the goal. 
Nate, so, let me throw one more in, especially yeah. from a sales perspective, um, is prospecting, right? <clears throat> one of the abilities is to identify what tangible audiences that publishers have within their data. So as a sales prospecting tool, as a way of having something in hand to go out and, and close those deals, there's a tremendous amount of information that can be used to just start the sales process and have a good ability to walk in and make a good conversation. Um, <clears throat> the other aspect of it that we kind of skipped in the um, uh, values earlier, but I was meaning to uh, throw in is all of this is ex exceptionally privacy safe from the publisher and the reader's perspective, right? You're leveraging things behind the firewall on Facebook. So what we do, what the publisher does, um, whoever's doing the ad execution is completely independent from any PII. It's totally within the realm of GDPR and CCPA. Um, we're not dealing with any identifiable information, email addresses or otherwise. So everything that's happening is a function of the content and identifiers that live outside of the publisher's ecosystem. So there's never any slimy matching or, or you know, concern about exposing um, identifiable information to anyone. That's a fabulous thing to point out. So thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that for sure. Absolutely. Yes, we, we think of it as the cookie-free diet of advertising. That's yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So um, publishers use this technology to promote personalized subscription offers like we were talking about to the most highly engaged readers based on what they know about them. Um, they can use it to guarantee views on sponsored content with the low cost of retargeting campaigns on Facebook. Depending on how your website is monetized, it is possible to drive, again, only through retargeting campaigns, traffic from Facebook for less than you would actually be generating based on the impressions on a given page. So one of my favorite examples of this is, you know, sponsored content or, or native advertising content is really useful and very easy to sell to people. But one of the things that's difficult is trafficking enough people to those pages to guarantee the eyeballs, the views that you've uh, sold them. So, you know, you, uh, Johnson and Johnson or Boeing or somebody comes through and you know, spends 25,000, 50,000, a couple hundred thousand dollars on your website. You want to make sure that they're happy and that they want to keep coming back. So you could be using this technology to find, readers that have read other content that's relevant on your website and bring them back so that they're looking at the sponsored content, therefore fulfilling the you know, number of impressions that you guaranteed for them. And likewise, and this is a little bit of a reversal, you could be tracking that sponsored content and then delivering Boeing or Johnson Johnson, whoever's spending the uh, sponsorship dollars with you, that same audience off the platform. So would you like to not only reach the people who read your content on our website, but reach them for weeks and months afterwards so that you can you know, move them further down the funnel? And that's just additional advertising impressions that you didn't have. So those are incremental ad dollars that you can go after. And then that kind of dovetails into this third point, which is because we're talking about, in this case, specifically social advertising, um, social advertising is hot. Everybody wants to be doing it. Almost everybody is advertising on Facebook, but it doesn't work as well as it used to. And some kind of differentiated data is really the difference because of Facebook's uh, time with Congress and some of the embarrassing things that happened to them in the last couple of years, they have removed a lot of their targeting criteria and limited what it is that you can do with their data to effectively find the right people. But again, you have the data, you don't need their help. And so you can provide something to advertisers that they literally can't buy on their own. They can't run Facebook ads based on your reader data. Only you can do that. So if you are doing that on their behalf, you're not selling them in their print budget and you're not selling them in their media advertising budget, you're going to be able to tap into new budgets potentially through executing same audience they already value on a completely different platform they're already spending dollars on and be able to do that with like that 100% margin that we were talking about previously. So, so that's the big picture. Retargeting is beneficial to publishers because it helps them tap into this otherwise unused data source, which can be monetized or can be used to drive growth. Um, and, and that can be done in a manual way, like one URL at a time or on a site-wide basis. Those kind of simple retargeting tasks are, are pretty easy to do manually. You, you saw it took a couple of seconds to build the generic site-wide audience. But what if you want to do something that's more nuanced? Um, what, if there's, you're, what if you're trying to reach an audience of people who not just is into sports and therefore all sports, but a particular activity, a particular news story that's happening in the sports world um, that can't be done manually. For that, we have to, uh, to up the ante and provide some AI to pull everything together in the background for you. And that's what Market Chorus does. So we have a, a platform for publishers called Market Chorus Engage, and it does a lot of things, but for, the, for what's relevant to this particular presentation, 
Market Chorus Engage automates all of the things that we just talked about. It will find any particular topic or subject that matter that you want to uh, create an audience around. It will find all of the articles that are on your website or websites, bundle them together, extract the audience of not just one or two articles, but you know, dozens or hundreds of related articles, and automatically deposit that into your advertising account just in the same way that we talked about. And all of this happens in the background you know, with zero effort on your part. It's a click a couple buttons and send us an email and poof, you have an entirely new monetizable digital ad product in your advertising account. So let's, let's go through an example of, of how we might actually do that. So I'm gonna make up a, a theoretical potential client. Let's say, again, this goes back to the arts and entertainment world. People are being allowed out of their houses, at least in Texas, and uh, they're looking for things to do. Um, places like the, uh, the symphony orchestra or our various Dallas arts museums, you know, they're all hurting for business and they often function as, as a group. So what if they all bundled together some dollars to drive people to the arts district in Dallas and came to we'll say the Dallas Morning News with that need? We want to reach people who are tired of being at home. They're looking for things to do and they're, they're arts patrons. You know, what can you do for us? If you were trying to sell that in, in the newspaper, what you might do is position a, you know, some sort of native article or a, an ad adjacent to content that was relatively on the subject of getting out and, and doing something in, in arts and culture space. But digitally, that's not necessarily something you can do. When you run ads on a website, you know, the programmatic ads deliver them based on the audience, not based on the content. So that's not really something that, that would be easy to deliver. But using Market Chorus, we could come up with a couple of example articles. So a uh, first example article is this piece about the Moody Fund. So that's speaking to there's a need for people who want to you know, engage in arts and culture activities, but they've all been devastated by COVID. And so uh, people who are interested in that article are obviously interested in participating in that community. Then you have the people who are looking for events to go do things like this in-person events, an art show, the craft beer walk, people who would be reading that content likely, especially if it's more than one article, are trying to get out and do something. And obviously people who are just generally reading about arts and entertainment or that right type of people. So we would first run each of those articles through Market Chorus to match all the similar content. So I used the Moody article here, entered into our platform and searched it and it came back with a hundred or so articles that are adjacent to this subject. We would bundle all of those articles up. So it's not just people who read that one article about Moody, that's probably a couple hundred or maybe a thousand people who read that one article, but across these hundred articles, or if we continue to add articles into the mix, you could get thousands of articles. You're no longer talking about a few people. You're, you're talking about you know, tens of thousands of individuals and hundreds of thousands of potential impressions. So we would not only find the audiences for each of those three individual pieces, but we would Venn diagram them together and take the overlap. Uh, and in delivering that overlap into Facebook, we've now answered that advertiser's question of how do I reach the people who are itching to get out, who are clearly arts and culture patrons, and you know, they're looking for something to do right now. Uh, that would be very, very difficult to do and not something, unfortunately, that you could really do manually. But fortunately, with the Market Course platform, our AI, our machine learning algorithms are reading all of the content on your website and they're watching each person who's trafficking across that pixel and putting it all together for you and it just takes a couple of seconds to render that. Um, and the final step in this goes back to the final, the third step in how you build a retargeting campaign in general. The, the only activity that your team really needs to do is just pick it off of a list and put in the budget and the creative and, and run the campaign. And most of you probably have ad operations teams who are competent running Facebook ads, so this wouldn't necessarily matter to everyone. But if you don't have that uh, capability internally, you don't have enough heads to manage all of those ads, Market Chorus does have a sort of services offering where we partner with you to do some or all of that execution kind of as necessary. So if you're not ready to take on all the technical aspects, we can either work with you to train you on how to do that or work with you to just manage those for you know, a services relationship. So that's, that's it. Step one, find some content that represents the audience that you're trying to achieve. Step two, Market Chorus matches all of that content bundles it together and finds the intersection. So we're talking about that hyper niche, high affinity audience. Step three, drops it in your ad account and you know, either you or we run those ads. And so that's how you might you know, sell an ad campaign, but how do you use the ad campaign for your own subscriber or growth purposes? Well, that one just simply comes down to using that same data and the same audiences 
but targeting your most loyal readers with special subscription offers that are personalized based on their reading habits and, and even potentially current news. So there's lots of current news to work with right now. Anybody who's really interested in keeping up with COVID or is really interested in, in keeping up with what's going on with China or is interested in you know, borders reopening or anything like that, to, you know, if you're a, a travel agent or a, you know, your tourism department, you might be interested in the people who are reading articles about when things are opening up. You might be uh, interested as a reader in reading more travel content. And so you can work that in both ways. You can sell the audience and you can leverage the audience internally. And you know, you're, you're using the same technology and the same data that you own and nobody else has to do that. So final thoughts, you know, it's, it's simple to create a site-wide retargeting audience. You, you watch this do it a couple seconds. It's a little bit more complicated, but a little bit more valuable to think about it in specific sections or specific pieces of content. But that's limited because any one piece of content is only gonna have X number of viewers where if you can target people by the topics, by the stories they read, by leveraging machine learning and AI from Market Chorus, then you really have something that's magical, something that nobody else can do, that you can do with the drop of a hat, and that will differentiate you from other advertisers, from agencies in this space, from other publishers, and give you that ability to take back those ad dollars that have been draining out to the duopoly over the last couple of years, at least in terms of the 50% of it that you can own based on your own data. You know, you're still paying them to deliver the ad, but you're keeping an equal percentage of that when you sell it, or you're saving that money when you're using it internally. Um, Matt, anything you want to cap that off with? Yeah, that was great. Um, I, I would just add that, you know, I think it's important from a sales perspective to also remember that all of this, um, retargeting opportunity is not cannibalistic with any existing ad efforts, right? It's not taking the place of ad dollars from uh, display advertising or branded. Um, it's incremental. It's a new line item in a, in a new piece of IP, um, you know, based on your data that sales can add uh, to get incremental revenue. Um, and also just one piece on the automation side um, is, you know, Editors and, and writers are hard at work all the time, right? One of the efficiency models in all of this is to be able to keep up with new content. And that's kind of where the automation and platforms can come in to, you know, really help is there's always new content. There's always new people reading that content. So it's a very active and dynamic process that you can take advantage of, you know, multiple times, um, even on the same content. Awesome. I have a question for you guys, though. You know, as you've done this with, with different um, clients and different companies, you know, do you see certain types of content perform better? You know, is that sports or travel? Are, are, have you guys seen anything that, that really performs um, extremely well uh, versus another type of content? That's a great question. Um, I can give you a couple quick examples. Um, the answer is definitely yes, but certainly it is in the context of the type of campaign. Um, the, the forward DFW campaign that LMA was associated with as well um, is a great example. Um, in that case, it was trying to drive people to uh, volunteer um, certain community aspects. And one of the ways we were testing this out was actually to segment the content and, and actually test that theory. Um, is there certain types of content that perform better? So, you know, arts and community oriented content obviously performed pretty well. Um, but in that case, the one that blew everything else out of the water in terms of content um, segmentation was actually articles about the SPCA and pet adoption and pet care. Um, it had like a 17 or 18% click through rate, which was you know, off the charts. So um, I think you know, testing and, and optimization towards that and figuring that out in process can be you know, massively beneficial in terms of optimization. And there probably always is a niche or two um, where that's going to happen, but certainly is, um, you know, compared to what the uh, actual, uh, you know, campaign is, is representing. I think generally content, high level content, um, you know, looking at just sports, as Nate was saying earlier, or business sections, there's still noise in those, which is why we're so, you know, fond of dialing into, you know, content specific segments. Um, there's always going to be waste, right? But the, the lower down you can get in the targeting, the more specific you can get, um, the more money you're going to save and the more results you're going to get. So it, it certainly depends, but there is definitely truth to that. And that particular campaign, if I remember correctly, beat uh, Facebook's typical click-through rate by 445% because we were very specifically targeting the people who were you know, likely to be volunteers in the first place. Yeah, but also, I mean, that's, 
you know, we'll take a tiny bit of credit for that and not very much. But I mean, it's a reflection of also what types of readers are engaging that content, right? Um, obviously, you know, thoughtful and volunteer oriented people in the community are already readers and customers of the Dallas Morning News in this case. So, um, you know, it's, it's a huge treasure trove of, of information if you look at it from the content perspective. So awesome numbers. And, and, and I've always been very impressed with all the results from that Dallas Morning News campaign. So uh, for a DFW is a great place for a test, no question. I, I, just to close this out, you know, the big thing I think is, you know, a lot of times when you watch these presentations, um, I, I think people want to know, like, what, what should I do next? Like, what should my first step be? And so I want to have each of you guys just say, if I was going to start this tomorrow, what should I do first? Why don't you go first, Matt? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, step one, um, you know, I think we, we talk about this all the time too, right? Who are the, the stakeholders in this? Um, you know, it's figuring out where this is going to turn the needle and, and getting, you know, some amount of buy-in, at least experimentally. Um, you know, there's lots of technologies embedded in publisher websites, right? Whether it's video ads or, you know, some of the new platforms like a Zeus or something, those are all great. Um, you know, like we keep talking about, this is incremental and, and differentiable. I think the, the starting point is identifying the key stakeholders. Those are that are um, interested in growing revenue and, you know, just a small experiment in terms of, you know, figuring out if there's interest in ability to, you know, to do a trial. Um, it's easy for us to plug in and take the first step. Um, it's, you know, extremely cost effective. Um, you know, and if there's existing advertisers or new advertisers on the horizon that you want to offer um, something very differentiable to, then, you know, it's, it's, it's a good place to start. Yeah, I think I would probably echo that, um, but just add a, a little bit of color. It's from my own personal experience working with the Dallas Morning News sales reps, um, we were, we got the most traction initially by finding people who are already spending money with them but trying to reach an audience that there was a limited inventory for. So a couple of months ago, before COVID kind of changed the landscape, um, Dallas Morning News was completely out of all of their entertainment impressions. So any kind of content about go see, do stuff or movies or whatever was sold at a, a, the premium that they could sell their uh, CPM for on their own media. And they had people with significant budgets, a couple hundred thousand dollars that they wanted to spend specifically on Dallas Morning News readers. They, they weren't able to, to service that. So in terms of directing that spend off platform, it opened up you know, pretty significant new budgets to them. So that's one thing is look at the advertisers who you, you can't service and try to give them something more or the advertisers that you know, maybe had a bad experience or that you know, would trust you with anything. Just find some people who need solutions and are already trying to spend and look at this as a way to take the same core value proposition that you have, selling your readers that are already engaged and doing that you know, anywhere get them the rest of the time. Um, and then from the subscriber acquisition standpoint, definitely it, it, probably the, the marketing team is not as equipped in terms of ad ops execution chops as the ad ops team is. And so marrying those two teams together and trying to figure out, you know, what are the budgets that they currently have? How are they spending them? And where does this fit to make that more efficient? Because if they're already advertising on Facebook, but they're not using your own data and saving 50%, that's a, that's a huge opportunity just double the number of ad impressions that you can get in that platform. So getting everybody in the same room to kind of talk about it. Um, and, and we've got lots of content up on our website. We're, we're always available to answer any questions, et cetera. Matt and I both answer info at marketcourse.com. So if anybody has any like follow-ups or any specific help us figure out how to do this, we're absolutely happy to help. That was awesome information, uh, awesome advice. And we just appreciate both of you guys just sharing your knowledge and, and honestly, just what works and what doesn't is, is so beneficial to folks right now. So we appreciate the time and, and please contact these folks. If you guys do have additional questions, we'll make sure that we make them accessible to you. Um, thank you both. I appreciate the time today. Our pleasure. Well, thank you. It's our pleasure.